Yeah. Um, we'll continue the session with um, Associate Professor Johan Gesima from the University Scholars Program to speak on flipping screen teaching with iPads and Apple TV. Prof? Okay, Th thanks very much. Okay. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone um, after a very nice lunch. Thanks to CIT, to Ravi and Kenneth and um, everybody else for setting this up and for inviting me to share with you this afternoon um, a brief overview of what my students and I have done with um, Apple, uh, with, with um, iPads in, in, in our classes um, in conjunction with Apple TV last semester. So I'll talk about, um, briefly, about, first of all, the questions uh, that drove the trial and also its objectives. Um, I'll talk about the hardware and software in order, that we used in order to meet the objectives, uh, some problems that we experienced and some drawbacks of what we did. Uh, I'll focus on the two main apps that we used and just say a little bit more about them. Then um, I'll share with you some student feedback. Um, I'll show a short video, two-minute video, just to give a flavor of the class, make it a little bit more concrete, uh, specifically when it comes to mirroring iPad screens through the Apple TV um, in order to consider the benefits, specifically also uh, for flipping screens, switching between iPad screen and iPad screen, um, involving both the instructor and the, the students. And then I will uh, um, end by, by briefly asking whether... Flipping screens with iPads and Apple TV could also help flip classes, uh, which is, of course, we've heard quite a bit already this morning about um, flipping classes. Okay, so um, before we start, I thought it might be um, nice to have a back channel uh, for today's presentation. Um, and I suggest that we use um, today's meet. Uh, if you... Um, want to know more about back channels or about today's meet, there's a, there's a link. Uh, simply Google today's meet. Just type in today's meet. And um, then um, there's the room that I created. It's called Buzzed2013, which is, I think, simple enough for all of us. Um, it uh, should look like this. You simply um, enter your name. So I've already entered mine. I, just, I think I did it two days ago. Kenneth has um, entered. Thanks, uh, thanks Kenneth. Um, and then once you've uh, joined, let me join again, then you can type your message and um, hit say. Uh, it's completely device agnostic, of course. So if you have a, um, um, a laptop or um, if you have an Android phone or whatever you have, you're able to to write, uh, to, to, to participate in the room. So um, the useful thing about back channel, um, well, there are a number of uh, useful things actually. First of all, um, I find it really useful uh, to document what's happening in class. So at the end of the class, we have a transcript of all the various comments, questions, criticisms, um, which students have um, already entered. Um, in, 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 in the course of the event. Um, so this could be especially useful for large classes. I, use it, I, I experimented with it last semester because I just thought it was something interesting to do. It's like Twitter, so you can, uh, you, you, you can type 140 characters at a time, quite short. Um, often, uh, oh, the, the difference with Twitter is, of course, that Twitter is public, this is private. Only people with a link can get access to the room. Um, sometimes it, ha it has happened that um, conversations have taken place that um, students post, oh, I, I don't understand what he means when he says X, and then somebody else re replies and says, oh, well, you know, I think what he means is Y. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, the messages and conversation will be accessible to everyone who joined the room, and this particular room has a lifetime of one week. It's also possible to have um, uh, one-year rooms, which I've not tried, 
uh, two hour rooms, which is what I usually do, two to eight hours, um, uh, two, two to eight hour rooms for my classes. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to ask Kenneth to take over the screen and see uh, what's been happening with the, with the back channel. We can then also save that screen as a PDF, and then we, as I say, have a record of the class. I also have my iPhone here, so I can check um, what's happening, um, if, if people are actually joining and what they're doing. Okay. So uh, try it out and see, see how it works. First, um, then, some background. Um, I'm presenting this morning with an iPad, and I'm mirroring my screen through an Apple TV unit. The first thing I have to say is that, of course, I do not use the iPad and Apple TV to do what I do now. In other words, I don't use Apple TV and iPad to lecture or to present in this way. I use it in a small class, um, uh, in a seminar-style class, uh, called Power, Space, and Pleasure, which is a USP seminar in writing and critical thinking, uh, which is specifically oriented towards getting students to ask questions, research questions. Uh, it teaches them to read closely, read with attention, read critically, and uh, come up with their own arguments. Um, so um, we, ha we have various of these writing and critical class, thinking classes, uh, and they're compulsory for our USP freshmen. Classes are small, as I said, capped at 12. So I had 12 students in my class last semester. Um, a key topical question that's implicit in my class um, is, is that one, what might social media have to do with the, with the prison? Um, so so um, students come to class um, highly motivated. USP students, generally speaking, are interested and driven, um, and uh, they are... Um, that they prepared for, for, for the classes. They've already um, studied the content um, by reading documents and other materials. Uh, and uh, so in effect, this is like a small-scale version of a flipped classroom about which Adrian, of course, spoke earlier on. And I'll say a little bit more about that towards the end of my presentation as well. Okay, so what might, be, um, what might social media have to do with the prison? That's kind of the, 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 the question that behind the theme, but I won't say too much about that as long as you understand that this is a particular kind of class and I'm not making any large claims. Okay, some broad questions that drove the trial. First of all, I um, started using an iPad for teaching back, my own personal iPad back in January 2011. Um, and I did it really to comment on student work in PDF because it's easy to do it's easy to um, comment um, on PDFs if you have a good PDF reader, and there are many of those. Um, it's nice for archiving graded papers. It's also um, great to access readings on the iPad in PDF because they're searchable. Students come with one device. Well, I, I, well this was before the, the students got iPads. I have simply had all my readings scanned, and I put them all on the iPad. That was, um, wow, really convenient having all of them there um, on, on, on the one device and being able to take uh, them everywhere. Okay, so then, um, I, because I was using my own iPad for teaching, I thought, why not apply for a CIT loan and use NUS's iPad rather, which is what I did. Fortunately, I got the iPad, um, but I was still using it uh, as an individual, as the instructor for uh, those two semesters. Finally, um, beginning last semester, August, um, my students, um, well, I successfully applied for a, for a CIT iPad faculty student loan. And there were um, two questions that drove that. I think the first one had to do with pedagogical experimentation. And it's a very broad general question. It's too broad, really. How might NUS faculty use a mobile device such as an iPad for classroom teaching? And then in my own case, um, specifically in a small writing and critical thinking seminar, because that's what my class is about. And as you may know, the iPad is hardly meant for extensive writing. And again, I'll say something about that later on. So how on earth could one use an iPad in that context? Um, the second uh, question was kind of related, right? As, as value addition, what's the point? Um, what are the benefits, but also some of the drawbacks of using such a device in and also hopefully beyond the classroom? 
Okay, so I had a number of objectives. Um, assessing, accessing course readings on the devices I mentioned, commenting on and grading of student work, um, student peer work, uh, wh which I wanted to do by means of the iPads, and then, uh, which was quite ambitious, getting students to compile e-portfolios. Getting them to compile, compile a portfolio of everything they do for my class, for the semester, in one app and on one device. Um, and then, ultimately, I guess uh, what was the, the, the overarching aim for me, or what turned out to be the, the most important objective, was um, to see whether projecting iPad screens um, could actually make the class more interactive than it was before getting students to share their content in class by means of iPad screens. Um, right, so briefly the hardware, you're all familiar with iPads, of course. Apple TV is a small little unit, which is actually currently in this cupboard here. Um, I saw because there were problems uh, just getting the aspect and ratio read, uh, sorted out earlier on. It's in, the, in there and that's connected up um, to, to project wirelessly um, to to the projector, so that we can see what's on my iPad, um, and I can walk around. Again, I'm not going to do that now, um, but in a small class, or even, of course, if one has a large class and doing small group work, it's extremely convenient for me to go up to Ravi, go sit next to him, and talk to him about whatever it is that he's discussing with his teammates, um, and uh, then um, still be able to project from, from my screen. We did use the iPad in conjunction with desktops or laptops, not as a standalone device. Again, because it's a writing course. Um, okay, so yeah, this is basically what happens. Students have iPads, um, the iPad projects, the iPad screen gets projected in front of the class. The students um, mark up the documents um, using an app and uh, everybody gets to, see, gets to see that by means of um, uh, the, the, the setup. Okay, so the apps, software, um, I, just very briefly, let me say, I, I, I'll focus today on Evernote and Iannotate PDF, and also not even say that much about them. You may already be familiar with them in any case. Dropbox, which is, um, as competitors, uh, Dropbox was mentioned already earlier on. Of course, there are, there are lots of others, Box, um, SugarSync, and so on and so forth. But what's, what's nice about Dropbox is that it's integrated with um, quite a number of other apps, such as um, I Annotate, PDF. Um, so those are the three apps that we used most last semester. A number of other um, apps as well. We can talk about them at greater length later on if, 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 if you like or if there's time. Um, but uh, let, me, let me move on rather in the interests of, of time. Okay, so there were problems, I will say, um, um, initially, we had technical problems where uh, students didn't manage to connect to the Apple TV. They got sorted out, thank goodness, um, and pretty much most of the semester, it was the seamlessness of connecting uh, to the Apple TV that was most impressive. Um, again, as you'll see later on, I hope. Um, there was a learning curve. Uh, this whole thing of digital natives mustn't make us complacent. People tend to say, oh, well, our students... Uh, are born with iPhones in the, uh, I don't know where, but um, what would be a good metaphor? Um, you know, they're kind of born nor knowing how to use all these things. And that's not necessarily the case. We, I had a number of students who found the learning curves surprisingly steep. Then there were, there were problems also with app stability, um, apps crashing, students losing work. Unfortunately, this, this, this did happen. Late, uh, upgrades have, to a significant extent, uh, app upgrades have to a significant extent mitigated these problems, but let's not, um, um, you know, let, let's be candid. There, there were some problems there as well. Some of the apps have limitations, especially if you try to use them for what they weren't designed to do, which is what I tried, of course, in the case of um, one particular app. Multitasking is a problem um, in two ways. The one way is um, that um, Paradoxically, it's sometimes frustrating to have everything on one device. So currently, all my slides are on here, my course materials, my notes, my papers, student papers, everything. 
And, um, of course, I can only project one, um, I can only have one, uh, one window open at a time. That's a limitation. I think of iOS. Uh, it's not possible for me to have a list of questions on the one side of the screen and on the other side of the screen, say, student responses. Um, so so that's, 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 that's an irritation, I, I find. So sometimes I actually have used two devices to, to run a class, an iPhone to project the slides and then uh, the iPad to walk around the class and, and sit in on groups. Um, a second kind of uh, multitasking can also be a problem. I get my students to do back-channeling, as I'm asking you to do a little bit as well, if you have comments, criticisms, and, and so on um, concerning the presentation, uh, post them to today's meet. But sometimes that kind of multitasking gets a bit much for students, sort of sensory overload, right? Um, I ask them to watch a movie and to take notes at the same time, um, and it, it can also be a problem. Um, then we had two iPad, two of the 12 iPads got cracked screens, which is a, you know, an expensive bit of damage. So that's a, another thing to be aware of when one wants to teach with iPads. And then finally, um, I think the, 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 being able to project through AirPlay and an Apple TV unit, you do need iOS or Mountain Lion. There are workarounds. I've heard of AirParrot. Uh, that allows a Windows machine to project through an Apple TV. But um, I haven't tried it myself. But that, that's as far as the problems are concerned. Briefly about Evernote, um, for those of you who don't know, it's a notebook service that syncs across devices. Hey, yeah. I know that um, in the School of Medicine, uh, they're trying to upgrade the wireless network so it can support up to 300 devices. Um, in my class, where we had 12 students, it wasn't a problem. Of course, 12 students is not a problem. But, uh, um, yeah, the computer center people tell me that uh, uh, you do need hardware upgrades if you want uh, large-scale uh, connections. Yeah. Okay, so it syncs across devices. Again, uh, device agnostic. You can use it on your Galaxy Tab if you don't want an iPad. Uh, you can use it on your Windows desktop. There's a web interface. And I used it for, for those purposes. E-portfolio, sharing, organizing, and archiving of notes. Um, it's really useful for clipping web pages. Um, I use it in conjunction with I annotate PDF, about which I'll say something again a little bit later on. Um, for course readings, student assignments, commenting and grading, peer work, and so on. So I have the stack of, um, of notebooks uh, within Evernote. Uh, it's like, almost like a, the idea was like a mini um, IVLE, I guess, a bit like the Google, Google Apps, Google Sites, but within one app, which probably is asking too much of the app, actually, I've discovered. Um, Shared notebooks uh, where students uh, got all their course materials. I also got them to submit their assignments. Uh, instead of to IVLE workbench, I got them to submit to this Evernote notebook. I will not do that again uh, for two reasons. One, the privacy question that I asked about um, actually at um, KC Chance, uh, um, after KC Chance talk this morning. I am con no aspersions cast on, on Evernote, but um, it is cloud storage. It's commercial. I don't know what happens to, the, to those documents who has access to them. So I won't do that again. Secondly, students did have syncing problems, and they upload something, and they think it's uploaded, and it's kind of, it doesn't get to my device. <laughs> it doesn't sync back to my device. So um, I think uh, Ivy Lee, I'll stick with for the time being as far as student submissions are concerned. Also, Evernote is not ideal for discussion. You'll see there's a discussion notebook um, over here, that's, uh, the idea was that we were going to use Evernote as a kind of like a, you know, instead of the forum, I believe forum, and uh, it doesn't work at all because of notifications uh, which are absent. Um, it's also not good for collaborative writing of documents. Uh, Google Docs, of course, is wonderful for that, and we, we'll use that instead um, this semester. What Evernote is great for is sharing and archiving and organizing of data. 
that's, it's, it's really fantastic for that. So each of my students created an e-portfolio. Here's um, just a, a, a screen cap of, of a few documents. I think it had, in the end, something like 70 or 80 notes in, to which were attached Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, um, various notes, various um, um, documents. Um, so... Um, we also, I also got students to share their notes in class to a shared notebook that we all belong to. The, these individual um, notebooks are actually um, um, only shared with me as instructor. Um, again, I, I, I just wanted to see how, how it would work out. Um, in, in future, possibly, we might share with the entire class. Um, so uh, the great advantage is, again, it's one central location on the iPad for all materials including the e-portfolios. Um, so it's easy to mail in notes to Evernote using an email address that's, that's associated with an individual user. If I use that email address, it will um, um, send the email to my notebook. Um, it's also possible um, to specify to which notebook it should go. So I created the Buzzet 2013 folder um, and um, I've been mailing in notes to myself uh, today already. Um, I think this is one that I... Uh, was this? I mailed... This is a brief note that I sent in for my iPad during your presentation. Um, okay. Um, so, so you can specify the particular notebook to which it has to go. Um, so this notebook is also shared. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you use either of those two links, you can go to that notebook in your web browser. Um, I've also posted copies of my presentation there in Keynote and PDF. Okay, so there are lots of PDF markup tools. Um, I, um, uh, Adobe Reader, which, which has actually quite recently arrived in the, in the App Store, is quite good as well. Um, I use it for, for, for those purposes that I mentioned already, especially useful the Dropbox integration, which allows you to replicate your file struct, structure and import documents as they are on your, um, um, on, on, on your desktop computer um, and, and have them in that file structure, folder structure on the, um, on the iPad. So this is a markup page from one of our course readings. My students would um, mark up the course readings before class, bring the iPad with the course reading in it, of course, um, to class, and then I'd ask them a question. So what does so-and-so say about whatever? And they'd reply, and I'd say to them, oh, show us. Where do you see that in the reading? Okay? And then they take over the screen from me with their iPad, and um, they, 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 they can actually then demonstrate this. They can, they can, they can zoom in, and um, um, somebody else can dispute or qualify. I also, um, this is an example of a part of a page where I provide feedback to a student's writing, a uh, student's draft essay. Um, so, so I use that a lot. Students appreciated that. Um, uh, I'll get to the survey in a minute. Um, here's an example of a research proposal on cyberbullying that a student um, um, shared with a classmate. And in class, they were marking up the document, and um, we also look at it in class. It's pedagogically extremely useful to get this kind of hands-on feedback and be able to share it immediately. So student views. Um, we, we did a number of things, among them a survey. Let me just briefly go through this in the interest of time. You know, standard questions. Um, I have to say it's a small class, small sample. Again, not making any large claims. But um, um, as to the veracity or usefulness of the survey, but even so, uh, we, we, we ran a survey um, asking them f these kinds of questions, the ease of use, the benefit of using an iPad, difficulties they found, rating different apps, and so on. Now, the average rating for benefiting from using the iPad for the semester, um, and of course they used the iPad not only for my class, but for most of them ended up using the iPad for, for all their classes, albeit not uh, to project 
to mirror the screen. That they could only do in my class. Um, the average rating there is 8.42 out of 10. Um, experience writing paragraphs or papers, only half the students bothered to reply to that question, only six. And the six who replied gave it a <laughs> very low score, 5.17, unsurprisingly, right? So this is not a laptop. Um, but then when it comes to um, annotating PDFs, their, their, their readings, their class readings, creating their own notes, the scores are reasonably good. Um, experience of reading documents, high score. Students appreciated being able to read um, their texts on the iPad, having them all here. Receiving feedback from me by means of I annotate PDF, high rating as well. But then uh, the one that I think uh, takes the cake is uh, usefulness of wireless projection or mirroring iPad screen. And there we have um, um, a high score, 8.83, with um, 11 of the 12 students rating this 8 out of 10 or higher. So these are some of the student comments. Um, I love this future. I thought it was great that students could seamlessly connect to the network, project their annotated documents. This made explanations much easier, rendered discussions much more precise. Um, discussion is, is sort of the key term that uh, uh, comes again and again in student feedback. I've got a short video to share with you, a two-minute video. I know we're running out of time a little bit, um, but um, just a two-minute video, then I'm almost wrapping up. Uh, to give you a sense of what, th what happened in our class. In my classes, discussion always takes center stage as students collaborate on and share their work. iPads in conjunction with an Apple TV unit are making my classes even more interactive than they were before. I think the use of the iPad and Apple TV has helped uh, very much in class discussions where you can uh, set up and mirror your screen to the students. Uh, what, what is on your iPad screen is the screen up there, so that everybody in the class can see uh, your own annotations and your own take on um, the topic itself, and it, it, it promotes class discussion much more. I think the, probably for me the most um, impressive feature of technology is the fact that it is possible for us, more or less seamlessly, with, uh, to s switch from screen to screen, from iPad screen to iPad screen. So, for instance, um, if um, I ask uh, students a question, uh, and that question pertains to a particular document, then I can ask students to justify the, re the response they give to me um, in reply to my question by showing us as a class um, they, why they think uh, the answer is what they think the answer is. In other words, um, they um, can show us directly and, and, and share that with the entire class, and other members of the class can then respond in turn and justify their particular decisions. The second thing that I think is extremely useful is the way in which um, it is possible for us as class members to see the way in which students work with text. We can see the annotations, we can see the markups, we can see the comments, the questions, um, so that students get a sense that uh, the documents with which they are working are not static, but um, uh, that, that it's important to interact with those academic sources in order to become uh, participants in the scholarly conversation, which is what this course is, is entirely about. Okay. So the, I, I, I guess the main benefits of using iPads in the classroom, and specifically using iPads with Apple TV, would be, um, whoops, sorry, um, would be the seamless swapping of the mirrored screens, which allows enhanced discussion of course, texts and student work through sharing. So the focus is very much on problems and feedback. It's much more student-centric. A teacher-learner hi hierarchy is broken down to the extent that I don't, I'm not the sage on the stage. I, I do not stand in front of my students the way I'm standing here right now. Um, and a very mundane issue, it saves time. It's uh, great for student presentations. Uh, they, they simply stay where they are in the classroom and they start, uh, they start presenting. Um, so um, I, I was wondering, uh, before we get to that, uh, do you want to see if you can take over the screen, perhaps, um, Kenneth? See if this works.
Hey, that's nice. <laughs> so, by adding PDF, right? So, if you add, if you have, uh, I annotate PDF on your device, then it opens, it opens, I annotate. There we are, and then, yeah. And then at the bottom right, you should be able to, to scroll up. Bottom, bottom right. Oh, oh, right. So tap the arrow first. Sorry, at the top. Yeah, save page as PDF. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. In my students, fortunately for, for them, it was enabled. But you, you, you can just show them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you can type comments and you can um, insert, you know, typewriter comments, um, you can insert speech bubbles, draw lines, um, make designs, various things. Um, focus in on, on particular parts of the page. Okay. Right. Okay, so I, th I think that gives an, an idea. Shall I, shall I take over again? Yeah. So, so then I tell, I tell my students, uh, you, you, you take over the screen when we decide to take over the screen. Anybody can take over the screen, but of course, if everybody takes the screen over at the same time, it's kind of chaos. So that's never happened. So thanks, um, Kenneth. I'm taking over the screen. There we are back. And then a sort of speculative um, ending in the zero seconds I have left. Um, so... As we heard this morning, flipped or inverted classrooms involve um, very often remote learning through, for instance, online videos, quizzes. The lecturer can assume content familiarity at the very least, if not, if not internalization, but at least the students have, will have had access to the content, be it chemistry, be it whatever. Um, and then face-to-face -face class time can be used for hands-on work, not content transfer. So those are sort of three very basic, I, I suppose, um, elements of... Uh, the inverted or flipped classroom. Now, when it comes to flipping screens, I think in my class, which was a small class, admittedly, there was a great deal of enhanced inter interactivity and discussion. And I think that there's real potential to scale this up. Um, if one were to have um, multiple iPads uh, in a class of 100 students, 100 iPads, um, if students have had these video lessons beforehand, done the interactive quizzes online, um, and come to class with a familiarity with the content where they can do hands-on work. You talk about an absence of a lack of screens in class. Well, if you have iPads, then you have as many screens as there are students. There are wonderful whiteboard apps that students can use, not only for writing um, um, tasks, but also for, for mathematics or whatever the case may be. So I think it really has the potential to enhance students' in-class experience um, especially if what is required is hands-on work with problems. And that's, again, uh, exactly the way I, I try to use it in my class. So thanks very much. Sorry we overran slightly. Thanks very much. Thank you, Associate Prof.